Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Study Abroad for Rouser College Students Information Session. My name is Michelle Ayazi. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an advisor in the Berkeley Study Abroad Office. Super, super happy to have you all here with us today, and I'll let Megan introduce herself. Yay, thanks, Michelle. Hi, friends. My name is Megan Darasbini. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Assistant Director of Advising and Operations in Rouser College, um, and I do lots of things for the college, but one of the things that I love the most is um, helping to coordinate with Berkeley Study Abroad and UCEAP to get as many of our students out to study and see the world as possible. So um, I'm excited that you all have joined us, and um, we're really lucky to have Michelle and her expertise um, to get us started for this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, we can go ahead and advance the slide. So what will we be reviewing today? Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about Berkeley Study Abroad, um, talking about uh, why students study abroad, where you can go, when you can go, how to pay for it, how credit transfer works, how application and eligibility works. Um, after that, Megan will come in to go into more detail about college-specific requirements, college-specific resources, and policies related to study abroad. We've allotted some time at the end of today's presentation for questions and answers, so um, you're welcome to hold your questions until all of the content has been presented. Um, we do have someone from the Berkeley Study Abroad Office uh, on the chat, monitoring our chat, the Q&A. Um, his name is Ian. And so if you have any clarifying questions that come up for you during the presentation, um, Ian may be able to answer those um, during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll save all the questions until the end when all the content has been presented. Next slide, please. So we imagine that you're here because you're interested in studying abroad or at least interested in learning about study abroad. Um, so what are some of the reasons that students want to study abroad? Well, through study abroad, you have the opportunity to live for a period of time in another part of the world. You have the opportunity to meet different people. You have the opportunity to have new experiences, to learn about and adapt to new cultures, to overcome new challenges, different challenges. Of course, I'm sure many of you already knew this, but really simply put, study abroad offers students a really unique opportunity to learn and grow in a new environment, all the while making academic progress. So this is why it's called study abroad. So on study abroad, you can take classes to fulfill major requirements, you can take classes to fulfill minor requirements, and you can take classes to fulfill college breadth requirements. Um, you may wish to use study abroad as an opportunity to explore a completely different field of study, so something outside of your major um, while you're abroad, or you may want to use study abroad as an opportunity to take classes in your field of study that just aren't available here on campus. You can um, use study abroad as an opportunity to learn a new language or to improve upon a language in which you already have some background you may wish to study abroad in a location where you have some um, ancestral or cultural roots. So you may use study abroad as an opportunity to explore your heritage. Um, you may wish to use study abroad as an opportunity to get some hands-on experience, like some practical experience by doing an internship or research um, or field work for academic credit. And um, you may also gain a special type of insight um, while you study abroad, like uh, you may be able to do some networking or develop skills that will positively impact your career um, opportunities or your career direction. So, um, and if there's anything like that you know we didn't cover when we talked about why study abroad like feel free to add that into the chat um, it's always yeah we're always um, looking to learn um, about our students so feel free to add into the chat any other reasons why you are interested in studying abroad so where can you study abroad next slide please thank you so UC Berkeley students can study abroad pretty much anywhere in the world. Berkeley Study Abroad offers a lot for Cal students to choose from. All in all, we offer almost 200 programs in over 40 countries. 
So almost 200 programs in over 40 countries. And this includes summer programs, this includes fall semester programs, spring semester programs, as well as academic year long programs. The exact number of countries and programs offered, it varies from cycle to cycle. So this is approximately what we're offering in total for academic year 24, 25. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we're going to talk about program options now. So the following programs um, or like the sort of the, these are like the three main programs or three main pathways available to you as a Cal student. So first we have the University of California Education Abroad Program, also known as UCEAP. So UCEAP is the UC system-wide study abroad program provider for all UC students. UCEAP offers summer programs, semester programs, and year-long programs, academic year-long programs. And the hallmark of UCEAP, like what makes it different, what makes it special, is that they offer a diverse portfolio of program types. They offer a lot of different types of programs for you to choose from. So I'll sort of paint a little picture. Um, so for example, like if you can imagine study abroad programs being like on a spectrum, on, on one sort of far end of the spectrum, we have what we refer to as immersion programs. So this like immersion programs are the types of programs where like you are studying at a university abroad. So you're at a university abroad, you are choosing classes from that university's broad curriculum of courses, you're sitting in classes next to local students and other international students, you're living in campus housing or in homestay or an off campus apartment, like um, just like an international student, an exchange student coming to Berkeley for a semester, like that would be you, but in another country. So that's what we refer to as immersion programs. Sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have programs that are constructed by UCEAP just for UC students. So these are thematic programs. So these programs usually revolve around a particular topic or a particular theme. And um, because of that, they don't have a broad curriculum of courses, but rather a set menu of courses that are focused on that topic or theme. And instead of being at a university, you're placed at a UC study center abroad. So the University of California has um, study centers around the world. And instead of being at a university, you'd be at one of these study centers. And so you'd be in classes with other UC students. Um, so these are like two sort of very different types of programs that UCEAP offers. And then they offer literally everything in between, right? Like um, almost um, uh, 185 programs in over 40 countries. So like there are hybrid versions of these. And by hybrid, I mean like um, where some of your classes are at a university and some of them are at a study center. There are programs where um, you can do lab work, research, internship for academic credit. There are language and culture programs. Um, so uh, lots to choose from. So that's, uh, that's what UCEAP is. In addition to UCEAP, our office, Berkeley Study Abroad, we offer our own homegrown summer programs. So these are summer only programs and there's two different types. One is called Berkeley Summer Abroad and the other one is called Berkeley Global Internships. So I'll talk about Berkeley Summer Abroad first. Um, Berkeley Summer Abroad are faculty led programs. So these are Berkeley faculty teaching a Berkeley course, like a special topics deep dive course. But instead of the course being taught on campus over the summer, it's taught abroad. And um, Berkeley Global Internships, which is our other type of program that we offer, is as the name suggests, um, this is an international internship program where you're placed in an internship, like based on your interests. And um, the internship is for academic credit. And alongside the internship, you're also taking a local culture course. Other UC campuses also offer, like some of some other UC campuses also offer their own homegrown summer programs, like UCLA, UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, UC San Diego. So they also offer summer programs that are available to you as a Berkeley student. So you have a lot to choose from. Um, when you participate in one of these UC programs, 
every course you take on your UC sponsored study abroad program will automatically post to your UC transcript. So all of the courses you take, all of the units you take, all of your grades will post to your transcript and factor into your UC GPA. Um, the question though of whether the course from abroad would fulfill a major requirement would be up to your major. If it wants to, if you would like a course from abroad to fulfill a minor requirement, it would be up to your minor. And if you're looking for a course to fulfill a college breadth requirement, then that would be up to the college. In addition, when you study abroad on, um, oh, also, and then Megan's going to go into more detail about that, what that means for Rouser students specifically. So that's what the second half of this presentation is. Um, also, when you study abroad on a UC-sponsored study abroad program like UCEAP, Berkeley Summer Abroad, Berkeley Global Internships, or another UC campus-based summer abroad program, um, all of your financial aid travels with you. And I'll talk about financial aid um, in a couple more slides. And then finally, if you happen to not find what you're looking for through all of the options available through UCs, then you can look outside of the UC system. We refer to that whole wide world of non-UC study abroad programs as independent study abroad. Um, the main thing with independent study abroad is your financial aid won't travel with you. And um, you will need to have your program reviewed in order to determine whether the units from your program are transferable back to Berkeley. If they are, then you may earn transfer credit. And we have staff in our office to assist those of you who are interested in this pathway, um, you know, to help you navigate it. And next slide, please. So you may be getting excited and wondering when is the soonest that you can study abroad. So um, the soonest that all of you can study abroad would be summer 2024, so this coming summer. So um, just kind of going back to policies like students who enter the university as like who enter UC Berkeley as a first year student can study abroad as early as the summer after your first year. Students who enter UC Berkeley as a transfer student can study abroad as um, after having one semester in residence. So just given where we are in the academic year and given where we are with our current application cycle, this basically means that the soonest that all of you can study abroad would be this summer. The latest that you can all study abroad could be your last semester at Cal um, or the summer after your graduation ceremonies. Um, some students may even ask for an extra semester to study abroad, and we just leave that up to the college to advise you on and to approve, and Megan can talk more about that. And so that's, that's the earliest that you can study abroad and the latest that you can study abroad, and you can also study abroad any time in between. Um, so it is possible to study abroad multiple times and still stay on track for graduation as long as you start the planning as early as possible and remain in close communication with your academic advisors. A lot of students want to know like when is the best time to study abroad and generally speaking like there's no one time that's the best time like it, it's we really refer you know we really encourage students to check in with their academic advisors because a lot of the, um, like what influences when is the best time to go abroad is the student's academic plan like when um, in addition to your academic plan like what you're hoping to accomplish abroad um, when your programs of interest are available and just your personal personal needs and your preferences as well. So there's no one best time to study abroad for all students. It's really a personal decision. And again, it is possible to go abroad more than once um, as long as you plan carefully. So in terms of applications and eligibility, um, applications are due anywhere between six to 10 months before a program begins. So advanced planning is like really a must. Um, application deadlines vary by program. Um, so if you're interested in summer 2024, for example, um, applications will be due as early as like now, um, as early as January, all the way through March. So it really depends on the program. Um, not only do application deadlines vary by program, but eligibility requirements vary by program as well. 
Um, the majority of our programs are open to all majors. Sometimes students want to know like where they're allowed to study abroad is their major and um, pretty much every single program is open to all the majors. Um, we do have a tiny number of special focus programs that require some background coursework. Um, but the majority of our programs do not have any course prerequisites. Um, in terms of GPA requirements, like those vary by programs as well. So we have programs that require a 2.0 cumulative GPA all the way up to programs that require a 3.3. Um, but many of our programs require like 2.0, 2.5, 2.75, 2.85. Again, it varies by program, but they're usually pretty reasonable. Um, as long as you're in good academic standing. In terms of class standing, um, those also vary by program. So we have programs that will accept sophomores and up, and a sophomore would be like the summer after your first year. So programs that accept students that are sophomore and up, and programs that accept students that are juniors and up. Um, so um, no need to wait until you're a junior, for example, to um, to study abroad if you're ready to go to next year and you're currently a first year student. Um, in terms of foreign language requirements, um, some students think that they they need to know another language in order to study abroad. Um, or, you know, they might need to only study abroad in countries that are English speaking if they don't have any previous language background or don't feel confident in another language. And um, yeah, it's simply not true. Like, we just really want you to know that you can find like at least one program in every country that we offer where all your coursework is taught in English. So we have many programs, many programs that do not have any language prerequisites. Um, the majority of our programs, like many of them, are able to accommodate all qualified applicants. So what this means is that as long as you are qualified for a program, you meet the minimum eligibility criteria, and you submit a complete and thoughtful application by the deadline, you have a really good chance of getting in. Uh, we do have some programs that have space limitations. We call those programs limited capacity programs. And the programs that are limited capacity those programs take students on a first come first serve basis, like first application, you know, like based on the timestamp of your application, right? So either um, the program can take all qualified applicants or if the program is limited capacity, then it accepts students on a first come first serve basis. Um, and we have a list of all of our limited capacity programs on our website. Um, so none of our programs are like competitive in the sense where your application is being ranked against others based on your GPA or your major or any any other anything else other than your timestamp. And um, and what this means for most students is that you only apply to one program. It's like like the sort of like you are in the position of power where you can choose the program that you want to go on, that you feel will meet your needs academically, personally, professionally, financially. Like you chose your, choose your program and either the program will take all qualified applicants or if it's limited capacity, then you'll just apply as early as possible in the application window to maximize your chances of getting in. Onto how do I pay for study abroad? So this is like a big question that students have. So I'll spend a few minutes on this slide and we can advance to the next one, please. So, you know, I was talking earlier about how like application deadlines vary by program, eligibility varies by program. Um, and so it's same thing with cost, right? Like the program cost varies by program. Um, so when we talk about program costs, like pro the program cost is always comprehensive, meaning that it takes into account not only like how much the tuition and fees are for your program, but it takes into account like how much it'll cost for you to live in that country, like your housing, your meals, um, your local transportation, your um, books and supplies, visas, passports, insurance. So um, every study abroad program has a program page and every program page has a cost section. And in that cost section, it tells you how much that program costs in total. Some programs cost in total about the same as the equivalent term at Berkeley. Some programs cost in total um, less than the equivalent term at Berkeley. And of course, there are some programs that in total cost more than the equivalent term at Berkeley. So you'll find a range. 
The glorious thing is that if you are a financial aid student, like all of your financial aid travels with you when you study abroad. So when we talk about financial aid, we're talking about grants, scholarships, and loans from the federal government, the state government, and our university. Like all of your financial aid travels with you when you study abroad, and your financial aid package is matched to your study abroad program budget. So whatever your study abroad program costs, you'll be provided with a financial aid package totaling that amount. Um, now, what that means for you personally, like in terms of like what that means, like in terms of like how much of your package will be gift aid versus loan aid, we want you to know that information as early as possible. And so you can request to get a financial aid package estimate. And so we have a section on our website where you can make that request and it's on the slide. We can also put it for you in the chat as well. So once you've narrowed down some programs, you have a program chosen, you can request a financial aid estimate and we'll let you know how much um, of your financial aid package will be covered in um, gift aid, grants and scholarships, and then how much will be offered in loans, just out the gates without applying to any additional scholarships. And so for all students, like please know that when you study abroad, you're opening yourself up to the whole wide world of study abroad scholarships. Like there's a lot. Um, and any scholarships you get will um, help replace any loans that are part of your financial aid package. And if you're not a financial aid student, then any scholarships you get will help offset the cost of your study abroad program. Um, and uh, yeah, so you see Berkeley Study Abroad offers scholarships, UCEAP does. Um, there are national scholarships, country specific scholarships, academic scholarships. So um, on to the next slide. And this is um, sort of wrapping it up for um, my section before I pass it on to Megan. Um, so we offer advising in Berkeley Study Abroad. So um, yeah, although this has been a quick overview, we really hope that you'll, um, after this session, be inspired to reach out to us. Um, we offer general advising, um, general study abroad advising with our peer advisors. We offer um, country-specific, program-specific advising with our staff advisors. So like I'm a staff advisor, and we also offer financial aid advising as well. And um, Ian can put into the chat the link to our um, advising guide where you can make an appointment with us. Um, we do virtual appointments and we do in-person appointments. Uh, we're located in Stevens Hall, which is on central campus right by the Campanile. So um, yeah, I think uh, that's it for my part. And I'll now pass it on to Megan, who will talk about what you need to know as a Rouser College student studying abroad. Okay, yay. Thank you so much, Michelle. So I feel like I have heard you say these things many times, and I still learn something new every time. So I really appreciate all of the expertise that you shared with us already this morning. Um, so friends, I, we're going to talk a little bit now about what this means for you in Rouser College. Um, you know, a lot of what Michelle said in terms of it will vary by major, that kind of thing. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that apply to all of our students, and then we can get into the nuances of a couple of different um, tools that you can use to plan depending on your major um, and what you hope to do with your study abroad experience. Um, so in terms of our policies as a college for study abroad, um, have completed at least one semester at Cal, so that aligns with the study abroad, you know, Berkeley study abroad's um, policy anyway, be in good academic standing. Um, so the campus wide language for that is not being on academic probation. We want you to be doing well academically. Um, we want you to be declared in your major in the college by your fifth semester. Um, so for those of you who have come into the college undeclared, if you're studying abroad before your fifth semester and you're not yet declared in a major in the college, that's totally fine. But once you get to your fifth semester, we want to make sure we're prioritizing getting declared in the major um, before we then make space for study abroad and incorporate that into the program plan. Um, so that's another component. And then making sure that you're able to meet senior residency. So um, this is a complicated policy, honestly, that I don't like keeping track of because it can sometimes get kind of convoluted. But essentially, it's um, a requirement that students, once they reach a certain number of units, um, completed that they complete a certain number of remaining units on campus. Um, but there's a modified version of that for students who are studying abroad. 
um, through a UCAP program. Um, and so for the most part, for students who are studying abroad and are otherwise making reasonable degree progress, senior residency is not something that you need to worry about, but it will certainly be something that you and your advisor will be keeping an eye on. Um, and it's something that you can check for in your academic progress report in Cal Central. You can run that for modified senior residency when you've studied abroad. Um, but in general, that's um, not a concern for students who are you know, completing most of their units at Berkeley as they're moving through their degree. <clears throat> and then, so what do these things mean? Um, they basically mean we want you to plan, <laughs> similar to what Michelle was sh sharing, you know, the planning. I mean, some of it requires early planning, right? Like some of those application timelines, if you're planning for 10 months in advance, you may not know what your life is going to look like 10 months, <laughs> um, 10 months from now. But if you know you want to be in Spain 10 months from now, then um, some of that is sort of the backwards planning of, okay, so what do we need to account for um, in terms of making sure we can incorporate study abroad into your completion of your, your degree and your major requirements? Um, so in terms of that planning ahead, um, some of that is, and this is a good time to do it, I will say our advising office really quiets down in November and December, probably because you're all necessarily focusing on finals, but it means appointments are really easy to find with an advisor right now. <laughs> and so it's a good time to say like, hey, I'm thinking about this. We always talk about winter break being a really good time to do some of this like bigger planning. Um, because you might have a little bit more time to dive into the explore tool on the Berkeley study abroad website, which is one of my favorite things to play around with. Um, and so this is a good time to maybe take 20 minutes to meet with your advisor to say like, I think I wanna study abroad. <laughs> and that's all you have to say. And then they'll start sort of talking you through what you might need to know and what's helpful to know in terms of your planning. Um, and then as Michelle mentioned, like if you're, if the program you're thinking about does have a language requirement, which you, it doesn't need to, you can see much of the world without that. Um, but that if that is the case, that one of the programs you're thinking about does have that language proficiency required, that obviously we should start thinking about where to incorporate that into your program planning nice and early so that you meet the required proficiency before you're ready to travel. <clears throat> Um, so what else? In terms of satisfying major and breadth requirements, um, we are different from LNS in that our breadth requirements are specific to major. So each major has a distinct set of breadth requirements. Um, and certainly major requirements, of course, will also differ, but we can talk a little bit about what that will look like and how you can plan accordingly. Um, so breadth requirements vary by major, but we do use the same categories of breadth as letters in science. And so that can make it a lot easier to use like the letters in science tools for searching for breadth coursework that you might take abroad. Um, only our environmental econ and policy major requires all seven of the LNS breadth requirements. Every other major is doing some combination of different courses, a subset of breadth requirements. Some majors will accept AP units for that, others will not. So that will vary, but we do have lots of students who will um, who will pursue satisfying a breadth requirement abroad. Um, and you can work with your major advisor on what makes sense um, for that particular requirement. Um, one thing that is consistent is if your major does require an international studies breadth or accepts international studies breadth towards their you know, total units for breadth requirements, um, that can be satisfied with your participation in a Berkeley Study Abroad program. So that includes the programs that Michelle, um, Michelle discussed uh, that you have available to you. Um, and then there's the sort of minimum grade thresholds for that to qualify. But for the most part, students who are studying abroad um, are pretty handily able to sort of satisfy this international studies breadth area um, while, they, while they are taking their other coursework. And that doesn't require that you take any particular courses. It is the act of studying abroad um, that we consider as fulfilling this particular requirement. And then some resources. So we've spent some time putting together resources that we hope will be um, really helpful for you. And I'm, I'll exit out of this presentation, and open up a couple of tabs to take a look at with you all. Um, but essentially what we've uh, created are sample plans for students so that that can help students understand for their major when it might make sense to study abroad. And you'll see on a lot of those sample degree plans that there's like a little asterisk on like, this is one place to study abroad. But like, if you talk to your advisor, you could probably study abroad in seven different other places in your program plan. Um, so that's something that you can keep an eye on. Like we make a suggestion, but there are usually lots of other variations. 
I will say for those of you that are in um, environmental science, that tends to be the, the most specific of our majors in terms of limiting when you can study abroad, because there is a specific class you can only take on campus spring of your junior year, and then specific classes re all related to your research requirement for the major um, that can only be taken on campus your fall and spring of senior year. So um, that means for environmental science, you can sometimes swing fall of your junior year, but even then you have to do some manipulation of the program plan. So um, that major, because of those specific campus-based requirements, is a little bit more limiting on when you can go in the latter half of your academic career. Certainly summers are still an option. Um, the other thing to consider um, that Michelle mentioned is in general for Rouser, we're pretty specific to term limits. So if you are if you are admitted as a first year student, you get eight semesters to complete your degree. If you're admitted as a junior transfer student, you get four semesters. Um, but we do grant an additional semester for someone who is studying abroad in a fall or spring term. And so some students will um, incorporate that in somewhere else in sort of their traditional four years and then add a ninth semester to complete other coursework back on campus. Some students will add that ninth semester and use that ninth semester to study abroad. Um, we have had feedback, and maybe this is a question that Michelle can address um, at the end, that maybe financial aid um, is not as available to students who are studying, adding a ninth semester and not completing degree requirements in that ninth semester. Um, and so we've had some feedback from financial aid as well that um, if they're adding a ninth semester to study abroad, you may need to be able to account for a degree requirement in that ninth semester so that we can make a case <laughs> for adding that additional time for your degree. So that's something that um, advisors are sort of helping students navigate if that's the case. Um, and then we also have a process by which students can check to see whether courses have been approved to study abroad. So in thinking about ways that you might incorporate study abroad, and this was also something that I think Michelle addressed really well right at the start, um, we have students who are needing or wanting to fulfill specific major requirements while they're abroad. Um, but we also have students who are like, I'm studying microbial biology, but I really just want to go take art history in Venice <laughs> for, for a semester. And I don't want it to have anything to do with biology or lab sciences or anything. Um, and so, you know, there are those are both great ways to incorporate study abroad. They require different types of planning, because if it's a semester where you're not satisfying any specific degree require or major requirement, aside from units, of course, um, then we may need to plan differently Whereas if you're going abroad and you want to be able to use specific courses, let's say for your concentration electives or something for your major, then that's a slightly different process. Um, and so speaking to that process, um, we have a couple of ways that students can sort of assess which coursework they may be able to integrate into their major. Um, we allow up to two study abroad courses to, um, to count toward a major, and that's generally up to two curriculum exceptions overall for any individual major. Um, sometimes students will petition for more than two classes for study abroad just to sort of get a sense because you don't always know exactly which courses might be offered when you um, arrive at the institution where you're studying. Um, and so some students might get, you know, three classes approved, but only will end up using, you know, two that they complete towards their major requirements. Um, so there are a couple of places where students can look to begin that planning. Uh, we have our study abroad database, which is the place where we have courses that have already been pre-approved by the faculty advisor for your major. Um, and I'll open that up in just a sec to take a look at with you all, but you can filter by your major and major requirement. And that gives you a sense of, oh, this one class that's offered at this particular university um, in Barcelona um, has already been approved as an elective for my major. So that's great. I'll be able to use that. Uh, and then if you're going to a place, and that's just a subset, right? So those are the things that we've been working on adding to our, our database, um, but it's certainly not inclusive. It's maybe 200 courses out of these many, many hundreds of courses that are available to you through all those study abroad programs. So the other thing that we have available is course approval petitions, and you would work with your major advisor. I think I want to go to this location, and I would love to get one to two of my upper division biology electives for nutritional science approved. Um, and then you can petition and the faculty advisor reviews the information about that course and says, yep, this is, you know, this aligns with the requirements for the major. We can count these two courses. 
Um, and then once you get the grades for those courses, your advisor does the APR, you know, the academic progress report updating, all, all of that magic happens to reflect that approval. Um, so I'm just going to exit out of our presentation um, quickly here to just show you those couple of things. Um, so the first thing is our study abroad website. So um, this has lots of information um, about the types of programs, about where to find other information, of course, linking to our partners at Berkeley Study Abroad, um, clarifying your personal goals, all of these other resources to go through. Um, so that's sort of our home base for study abroad for the college. And then in our useful links, um, we have lots of things there. So the four-year plans by major, um, you can link to, <clears throat> to see where the advisor suggests a study abroad opportunity. Um, and so they'll enter that into um, the particular term. So in this case for CRS, um, the advisor has indicated it for senior fall. Um, and then you'll notice, right, the asterisk. Because the upper division major requirements for this major are so flexible, you could probably study abroad in any other semester if you wanted. So in some cases, depending on the major, we just sort of like picked a term because that made the most sense. But um, there are frequently many more ways to incorporate, um, incorporate that into your program plan. Um, the other thing that we have here is the database. So I'll take a quick, actually, let's do our course petitions first. So um, if you want to petition um, a course to count towards your major and you didn't find it on the database, there's a petition for each individual major where you'll be asked to provide some information about who you are and then about the individual course or courses that you're hoping to apply to the major. Um, and then in order to see what's been pre-approved, um, you can come to this database, and this is these are all courses that have been um, reviewed by faculty advisors for each of the majors. And you can search, you can filter your search by um, major, by country, uh, institution, and then major requirements. So let's say um, we want to do a CRS. Um, area of interest course. And this is, you know, a, kind of a funny example because the area of interest is so flexible um, that in most cases, if you want an upper division study abroad class to count, it can count. <laughs> and you work with Sarah on that process. But if we search for courses that have been entered here as CRS AOI classes, um, you'll see some of our Morea um, coursework here, which we can talk about as well. That's a, a program that we're um, you're actually taking SBUM courses, so courses offered um, through our college um, in French Polynesia, which is not half bad, um, and then a number of other locations and courses. Um, and they get added to this database when a faculty member is approving a course for multiple terms. So there are sometimes situations where a student maybe is in a really specific situation, and it's a one-time approval for that student student, but many of these study abroad courses are approved for any future student who's taking them. Um, and you can filter, um, again, by other, other major requirements to see what else is here. And this is just a starting place. You'll see some of the lists are quite short by major. Um, if we go to some of the ones that are sort of more general um, biology coursework, sometimes the lists are a little longer. It's a place for you to start. Um, and then um, you can certainly then petition additional coursework as you would like. So this is one where we have other uh, sort of general biology coursework that's available. If you're trying not to take MCB 102 at Berkeley, you can take it in Germany <laughs> um, and have that count. So, um, so that's just an example of some of the resources that we have available to you to help you do some of this planning. Um, and I'm going to go back here. Um, <clears throat> okay. And then just sort of a sampling of where people go. So we do have like this push pin map up if you've come to visit our student resource center that has um, where, where some of our students have been, but um, you know, truly all around the world, which is very exciting. Um, lots of different topic areas. This is just sort of a sampling of where people have gone since most of the majors um, in our college, really with the exception of <laughs> nutritional science, I think, since most of them have some sort of um, sustainability, conservation, environmental science, um, some component of that. Um, a lot of programs that our students seek out um, do also have a focus in some of those topics. Um, certainly, you know, environmental economics is going to have more of the sort of um, business and economics um, coursework traditionally, um, but really a broad range. It's very exciting. 
And then Michelle gathered some data for us, which is super fun um, for our spring 24 um, study abroad adventures. And so for the college, uh, we have 82 students going to 17 um, different places um, to do their studies. And it continues to rise each semester, which is exciting that we're um, encouraging more and more students to um, fulfill some of their degree requirements around the world. <clears throat> Um, so in terms of next steps, yeah, so um, we you can sign up for the Berkeley Study Abroad newsletter um, to get lots of great updates and information, um, explore the websites that we um, have referenced, so studyabroad.berkeley.edu. Um, I wonder if I can just show you quickly. Um, I love the Explore tool because if you're thinking, okay, I'm not sure where I want to go, but I know I want to do spring. Um, and you can filter and just take a look at, okay, what's happening? You can get a sense of some of the application deadlines to get a sense of when you should be planning for things depending on the program. Um, so that's a great place to play around and, and look to see what's available. Um, and then of course, the study abroad website that we were just looking at, there's also a link here to our advisor, like how to connect with our advisors um, to talk with your major advisor about, about your planning. Um, and I think those are the things. So I think I should stop talking now. We have about 15 minutes. I see some things have been coming into the chat. I haven't been paying close attention there, but I'm wondering, are there questions that we should address first um, now, Michelle, or um, if anybody else wants to chat a question, we would love to hear from you. There was a question that came in through the chat regarding the Morea program. Oh, and yeah. Uh, so that program uh, is a limited capacity program. It's a spring program and it's limited capacity. And that one is, is unique, uh, is the way that selection is done. And so for that program, um, selection is more competitive and we do allow students to apply for a backup program if they're interested in Morea, for example, for spring 25, but are not 100% sure they'll get a spot. They can apply for a backup UCAP program in the event that they don't get into their first choice program. Um, and if there's anything else related to that program that you wanted to mention, Megan, you feel free to. Yeah, yeah, I just pulled up the, the Morea page. Um, so this is, um, uh, so biology and geomorphology of tropical islands. It's a program um, that is, you can see it's SBOM coursework. Um, there's a fall program and a spring program um, that have a different focus. So the fall program is more of an intensive research focus. The spring program is a series of um, specific coursework that you're taking. Um, and so the fall program is just like one big old 15 unit class essentially that you're that you're completing as a part of that. Um, there is an interview process um, for that program. It is also a program that depending on your major can count um, in some cases for up to three requirements um, for a particular major, MEB students especially um, find their way to Maria environmental science students. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a popular program um, and it is uh, does function a little bit differently than um, some of the others. And so certainly um, you can check in with your advisor on where um, where it might fit for you and then how to structure your major requirements around that. Another question came in um, asking, could I take cluster electives for the conservation and resource studies major abroad before I'm declared? I don't know that I've heard the term cluster electives, but in terms of CRS, like if you're doing, if you're doing some of those preparatory classes, like there's recommended that you take preparatory classes for your area of interest, your AOI coursework, um, certainly that could potentially um, be something that you take abroad, you'd work with Sarah on that. Um, those are recommended and not requirements for the major. So that also is different in that nobody's sort of like policing how you would complete that coursework. Um, but then, as I mentioned, if we're talking about the area of interest courses, that, that set of courses that you get to curate yourself um, in the upper division, uh, then it's, it's very likely that you know, you would be able to have up to two of those courses um, satisfy your AOI if you can um, incorporate it into um, the topic for your for your area of interest. And um, so I, I know when I talked to Sarah about study abroad for CRS students, it's um, it's pretty straightforward to integrate in most cases because of the flexibility of the major and the amount of agency you have over 
um, picking which courses go into that AOI. <laughs> I wonder too if I will stop sharing maybe for a second and then I can also see the chat. Student has typed into the chat. Are there issues with units transferring slash graduation if students study abroad in their final spring semester? Oh, I do have an answer for that. It can be the case, and Michelle, you can also maybe chime in. Um, it is frequently the case that grades with the partner institutions can take kind of a long time. I think sometimes like a six to eight week range, maybe. Is that accurate, Michelle? It can take um, around three months or 90 days for your grades from UCEAP to post to your transcript. Yeah, so a little bit of time. So um, in terms of what that means on our end for processing of your degree, for a spring student, a spring degree list student who study abroad in that spring, we have until the end of July <clears throat> to approve degrees for spring. And so that tends to be enough time for most programs, though it's not always enough time for all programs. And so um, what can happen for students in that case is that we would move them to the summer degree list um, we would get their grades, and then we can usually backdate the degree if the study abroad program ended in the month of May for a spring degree list student. If the study abroad program ends that first week of June, then automatically you have to become a summer degree student anyway, and it you know then we just wait for those summer grades, um, or for those spring grades that are sort of going into summer. For students who are doing summer study abroad, that's where we almost always have to move you to the fall degree list because the summer degree list window is shorter. And so it's much more common that a student who studies abroad in their summer, their final summer, isn't getting grades in time for us to um, confer their degree uh, for summer. And so then we're moving you to the fall degree list, approving, and then as long as the program ended in August um, or earlier, then we can backdate your degree. But it's a really good question for students who need immediate proof of graduation for a graduate program or an employer or something. Um, because we may not be able to approve your degree if we're still waiting on those grades. In some cases, depending on the situation and depending on the coursework you took while you're abroad, your major advisor may be able to write a letter on your behalf that says like, hey, this is just sort of the nature of what happens with these partner institutions. The student is otherwise on track to graduate based on the coursework they completed at Berkeley. Um, so I've done that for students in the past. And so that might be something that's available to you, but it's a really good question in terms of the timeline. Yeah, that's a great question. All of the units from your study abroad program will transfer back and will post to your transcript. So there's just a delay. This takes a lot of time. Um, I was also going, I have a, a specific question um, related to global internship credit um, and whether or not that could come from the college. Um, before I sort of address that directly, Michelle, for global internship credit, is that what is, is that still sort of like a UCEAP course number? Like what is the course number that's associated with the actual internship units? Yeah, the global internships, like the Berkeley Global Internships Program is run through UC Berkeley. So you're actually earning Berkeley credit and it is, I believe it's a 197 course is the internship courses that, that come. Um, and so the student is taking um, the internship for academic credit and then as well as a local culture course as well. Um, it's 198, right? Which one's the internship? So internship is 197. And I think for us, the relevant question um, for our students is we have one of our one of our um, college requirements is a certain number of upper division units in college. And so I'm wondering for the 197, like, does it have to does it matter which department it comes from? Like if it came from an SBUM, for example, when our environmental science policy and management, and it's an SBUM 197, then it counts towards those upper division units in college for our students, which can be really helpful depending on the major. Um, where, But if it needs to come from, like if it's a sociology 197 or something, then it doesn't do the same thing for us. So I'm curious about how that 197 department is determined. Yeah, that's a great question. I probably want to loop in Brianne Chang. She's the program manager for Berkeley Global Internship, so we can connect you with her. Um, for UCEAP, if a student is 
participating in a program um, where there is an internship available for academic credit, um, the they would based on like their the field of their placement, like their subject. Um, would be uh, related to their field. So like if they did, for instance, an environmental sciences related internship, then it would be like ES, like 197. Or if it were like a business, it, it would be a business one. Um, so that one for UCAP programs, I know for sure that it's related to the field of study. And so, um, and, it, and it's the student would choose. So it would be cross-listed and the student would choose the field of study. Okay, well, that sounds promising that potentially it could be from one of our departments if it's related to their, their course of study. Um, and then I just saw a question um, sent directly to me. Let's see. Oh, about when you walk and graduate in commencement if you study abroad in like a ninth semester. So um, campus has um, campus wide commencements in both fall and spring. And so if you were to graduate in a ninth semester and that meant you graduated in a fall, you could participate in campus wide commencement in that fall. Um, if you, for Rouser, we only have commencement in the spring. And what we do is we invite like for a spring 24 commencement, for example, we'll invite anybody from the fall 23, spring 24, summer 24, and fall 24 degree lists to participate in our spring commencement. So for example, if you're set to graduate in spring 25, but you want to extend to fall 25 to study abroad, or you're studying abroad and just need to extend to fall 25 to take additional courses on campus, um, you would still be invited to walk in spring 25 if you wanted to walk with your classmates and friends. Um, so yeah, so that would still be an option, or you would have the option to walk the subsequent spring after that ninth semester. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. <clears throat> Um, any other thoughts or questions, friends, that we can help clarify? <clears throat> okay, leaving the appropriate amount of time. Okay, I think maybe we can wrap up. Um, if that sounds okay to you, Michelle, I want to thank everybody. I know it's a very busy time <laughs> as you're wrapping up your semester and you've just come back from a long weekend. And so we really appreciate that you made the time to, to um, hang out with us and um, let us share all this exciting information about how to help get you abroad. Um, and we will be sharing the recording. We have to do some of the um, making sure the, the closed captioning and accessibility is in line before we share, but we'll make sure to get it out to um, everyone in the college once that's ready. Um, yeah, I think those are the things I know. Michelle, anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Just thank you, Megan, for your partnership. And thank you all so much for making the time to come. And um, yeah, really looking forward to working with you all, hopefully. Yay. Thanks, friends. And we're here to help, right? So check in with Berkeley Study Abroad Advising, check in with Rouser Advising. Um, we can help you do this. You're not alone as you consider planning and we're really excited for you. So, okay. Thanks, friends. And um, good luck with this last week of classes and finals and all of the many things you have ahead in these next few weeks. Um, we appreciate you. Have a great day. <clears throat>